Welcome to Maintaining Positivity, the podcast that looks at the headlines about health and fitness and digs deeper to look at the research behind the headlines. I'm your host, Brianna Bertolio, and I will help you separate the clickbait from the information you can use to live a healthier life. The September 19th, 2018 Huffington Post Everything You Know About Obesity is Wrong by Michael Hobbs exploded on social media. And I had intended on um, responding right away in my next podcast. But between a new job and getting sick a few times, as well as studying for my personal trainer test, I felt the need to take a hiatus. The only positive thing about the delay is that now there are think pieces which respond to the article, which gives me even more to respond to. If you haven't read the article, I would suggest pausing and reading it. I'm going to review the most important assertions made by the article, but if you've read it yourself, you can judge how accurately I'm summarizing. I'm also going to briefly discuss a piece responding to the Huffington Post article in the U.S. News and World Report, Everything You Know About Obesity is Not Wrong, by Charlotte Markey, um, from September 26, 2018. I think this is fruitful because I think both authors make important points. And perhaps it's tipping my hat to say this off the bat, but I am really glad the article went. this article went viral. I think it opens up very important conversations, and it's very much in line with what I, I want to get um to it with this podcast. Um, The format is going to be a little different than the previous podcast because most of the research he cites is very sound and there's a lot and there's a lot 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 of it so I'm not going to give an exhaustive review of every study cited. So basically um, if I mentioned a fact he cites you can be pretty certain I've I've already checked up on the validity. Um, There's only a few things that I I, um, pull some threads on. Okay, so to be clear about two things about where I stand. Number one, fat shaming of any kind is cruel and dehumanizing and should not be tolerated in any form. No one should ever have to deal with that. No, No one has dominion over another person's body. No one is under any obligation to change their body and there should be a lot more articles like this out there. And ones that go further and show the connections between fat phobia, misogyny, white supremacy, and unfettered and oppressive capitalism. I'm grateful for this article um, was published, and I, I think it will help a lot of people, or at least start conversations that can help people. And two, I can see how this article might not only liberate folks, but could also bum them out. Reading it might make a person despair that they could ever make sustained changes to their in, the, in their bodies. So if it sounds like I'm pushing back on a few things, it's not because I don't agree with the intent and the content of the article. It's because the philosophy of maintaining possibility, uh, <laughs> positivity is that sustainable, maintainable, positive health change and body positivity are not mutually exclusive. In fact, body acceptance is vital for any kind of positive body change. Shame is corrosive, only deepening negative patterns, reinforcing vicious cycles. All right, so I'm going to begin with a sort of a summary of the article. Um, Hobbes starts by telling the story of of the history of scurvy and how it is an early example of clinical trials and that experts understood how to treat scurvy actually very early and yet treatments were were known to be ineffective continue to be used. The parallel, of course, is drawn with the treatment of obesity. Hobbes' central thesis is that fat shaming is pervasive and incredibly damaging and does not help anyone um, to make healthy changes. It only makes things worse. While fat shame and degradation um, operate on a societal level, it is the medical community that Hobbes takes a, a task because a higher standard should be applied to people who are supposed to be helping improve health instead of ignoring research like the 17th um, century British Navy did. So some sort of key issues and then um, 
looking at the solutions that are proposed. Hobbes claims that rather than look at structural causes, the, and I'm going to quote, um, the medical community's primary response has been to blame fat people for being fat. Obesity, we are told, is a personal flame, um, failing that strains our healthcare system, shrinks our GDP, and saps our military strength. It is also an excuse to bully fat people in one sentence and in, then inform them in the next, you're doing it for their own good. Hobbes points out that fat shaming is pervasive and starts uh, early. Again, I'm, I will quote, nearly half of three to six-year-old girls say they worry about being fat. Oddly, he cites a master's thesis, which I would ordinarily raise an, uh, an eyebrow out, but a cursory sh search shows me that there is a su substantial body of literature that backs up, um, backs this up. So, you know, shrug. I don't think you should really ever cite master's theses unless there is literally nothing else um, on that particular topic, but it's fine. It checks out. Um, the author um, uses sings a line from my favorite song, which is diets don't work. Since 19, um, and I'll quote, since 1959, research has shown that 95 to 98% of attempts to lose weight fail, and that two-thirds of dieters gain back more than they lost. Chances are of a woman classified as obese achieving normal eight is 0.8%. Um, so then, Charlotte Markey wrote a response to this piece titled, Everything You Know About Obesity Is Not Wrong, and in it, she co-signed everything he says about body image and the negative impact of body shame. She actually wrote a book called Smart People Don't Diet, and also agrees with the statement that diets don't work. Where she pushes back is that she says that while di diets fail because they are inherently unsustainable and unhealthy, long-term change is possible through other means, as is evident from the experiences of people in the National Weight Control Registry, the NWCR, which I have referred to before. Um, and I've addressed some of these findings in previous podcasts, and we'll discuss more in the future, so I won't belabor it, um, but I agree with her that there is a difference between diets which exist to make money and adopting a set of behavioral changes slowly over time. The problem, of course, is that no one necessarily profits from a person eating breakfast instead of skipping it and the other findings. Um, that all said, not everyone is in a position to adopt the behavioral strategies I'm allu alluding to, either. It may sound silly to say, but I wish there wasn't such bias and cruelty because even when I say the words, there are some alt alternatives, I know that someone else might weaponize them to say, see, there are things people can do to lose weight, and then feel empowered to be cruel again. Another assertion that I think is a little more complicated is where Hobbes points out that as early as 1869, research showed that losing just 3% of your body weight resulted in a 17% slowdown in your metabolism, a body-wide starvation response that blasts you with hunger hormones and drops your internal temperature until you rise back to your highest weight. Keeping weight off means fighting your body's energy regulation system and battling hunger all day, every day for the rest of your life. So the slowing of the metabolism in response to loss of body weight, um, body mass, is, is a really important thing to point out because it is essential to understand the pernicious cycles of loss and regain, each time gaining more so that many people experience from um, multiple attempts at weight loss. The cruelest twist of attempting weight loss is that in an attempt to lose weight, people are actually putting themselves in a worse position than they were if they had never tried. But as episode two on the complicated relationship of exercise to weight loss and maintenance shows, what seems to be a significant cause of the slowdown in metabolism is the loss of muscle mass that occurs during the weight loss. Studies show that gaining muscle mass can offset this decline significantly. At the most conclusive finding about exercise is that it is essential to maintain a weight loss. So without incorporating a form of exercise that a person enjoys and can do nearly every day for the rest of their life, weight loss is usually not maintained. But exercise is not 
particularly good at causing weight loss compared with calorie reduction. So it's not always a priority for people attempting weight loss. <sighs> okay, it's complicated. So refer to, the, to that episode for more clarity. But once again, most people aren't being sold a slow building of muscle while slowly chipping away at fat because it takes a long time. And a long time is not fast. And not fast cannot be sold and profited on. Health and weight are not necessarily correlated or casual is another uh, arena that Hobbes is looking at. So now I will quote. Yes, nearly every population level study finds that people that fat people have worse cardiovascular health than thin people. But individuals are not averages. Studies have found that anywhere from one-third to three-quarters of people classified as obese are metabolically healthy. They show no signs of elevated blood pressure, insulin resistance, or high cholesterol. Meanwhile, about a third of, of non-overweight people are what epidemiologists call the lean unhealthy. A 2016 study that followed participants for an average of 19 years found that unfit skinny people were twice as likely to get diabetes as fit fat people. Habits, no matter your size, uh, are what really matter. Dozens of indicators from vegetable consumption to regular exercise to grip strength provide a better snapshot of, of a someone's health than looking at, at her from across the room. End quote. Um, so many people in the body positive community, as well as those who just are well informed about human health, will often say, you can't tell how healthy a person is by looking at them. And to the smart ass asses out there who inv inevitably pipe up with, um, I'm pretty sure I can tell that people on my 600 pound life are not healthy. Okay, yes, you win. There are people whose bodies are so far on the spe size spectrum that they are severely disabled by their size, and there is a very strong likelihood that they are not physically healthy. Okay, sure, you're right, that is likely. Just as you can look at images of children from Yemen and know that their body weights are too low. I think we can agree that at the far ends of human size spectrum, a lay person can make a reasonable assumption about health. Is everyone satisfied by that statement? Okay. <laughs> but the thing is, the majority of people are not at those extreme points on the spectrum. Most people you encounter in your life do, um, do not fall into those extremes. Most fat people are not 600 pounds. Even if to your eyes you think, that person is very fat, you are not qualified to diagnose their health from a visual scan. If you had not let that concept really sink in and hit, um, then it really then rewind and listen a couple times and until it really sinks in. If you have not internalized this concept, you need to. You need to if you're thin, and you also need to if you're fat. The same is true when it comes to judging the health of any body size. And again, if there is one concept that I can impart, it is this. Okay. There's a selfie I took, and I posted on Facebook, and I got a lot of likes. I posted it for two reasons. One was that I was wearing this cowl neck maroon sweater that always makes me think of counselor Deanna Troy and what she would wear on a ski trip on shore leave. And two, because I thought I looked pretty good. I really wanted to feel good about looking good, because it was pretty much the only thing I could feel good about. I had recently returned to the U.S. after two years living overseas and had wrapped up my travels with a wonderful trip to India. And the long story short, I came back with a protozoa in my guts. I was very sick and it took a long time to get health care because of the shortage of primary care doctors, my own slowness to action thinking it was stress of starting grad school, and the fact that it is really hard to diagnose and took lots of tests for a long time to identify the causal agent, protozoan hide. Um, hide. <sighs> Trust me, it's so gross and awful. I then also uh, was not treated successfully by the first prescription and had to take something much stronger. 
uh, basically my copay went from like five dollars to like 85 and I have really good insurance it was it was powerful uh, basically I was very sick for three months I had returned to the US in the best shape of my adult life and I really felt strong and healthy and overall okay with my body the protozoa caused me to lose a significant amount of weight very rapidly and that picture is me at my lowest adult weight I got so many compliments. My life was a living hell. I was in so much pain, so weak, couldn't do things I enjoyed, and was desperately struggling to meet my obligations. A lot of the weight I was losing was muscle. I couldn't eat any protein, vegetables, fruits, or fats. I could basically only drink ginger ale and eat things like licorice and gummy worms, or I was violently and painfully ill. I remember feeling so desperate when the test um, kept coming back negative. I wouldn't say I was suicidal, but I remember thinking that I might die if it wasn't figured out. Suffice to say, I was completely miserable. Damn, I looked good, right? I was totes healthy according to a BMI chart. I share this story because I was about as thin as I can be and as close to death as close to death as I could be. But just looking at me, you couldn't have seen that. One more time for the people in the balcony. I looked healthy, but I was anything but. Okay, let's go back to the article. Doctors have a huge bias against fat people. This impacts their health in real ways. So now I, am, I will quote the article. Doctors have shorter appointments with pa fat patients and show less emotional rapport in the minutes they do have. Negative words, non-compliant, overindulgent, weak-willed, pop up in their medical histories with higher frequency. In one study, researchers presented doctors with case histories of patients suffering from migraines. With everything else being equal, the doctors reported that the patients who were also classified as fat had a worse attitude and were less likely to follow advice. And that's when they see fat patients at all. In 2011, the Sun Sentinel pulled OBGYNs in South Florida and discovered that 14% had barred all new patients weighing more than 200 pounds. Phelan et al. has done numerous studies on, oh, so, and, sorry, end quote, and then, uh, Phelan et al. has done numerous studies on implicit bias in doctors and found that anti-fat attitudes are very common in doctors, both implicitly and explicitly. This is different than race, where the majority of doctors um, do not hold racist uh, bias, biases explicitly. So in other words, they don't think they're racist, but, they, but many do hold implicit um, bias. So they, that meaning that they have uninterrogated beliefs that they hold subconsciously. But when it comes to weight, uh, many doctors feel comfortable flying the anti-fat flag. So people uh, avoid medical tests and treatments because of how they are treated. Like getting a pap smear is unfun and vulnerable enough as it is. Why take off time off of work just to be humiliated? But seriously, get your pap smears, and if you are worried about how you'll be treated, ask around on social media for recommendations of doctors who are bo body positive. And most practitioners at Planned Parenthood are trained to be sensitive to size, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Don't let this bias get in the way of you getting the health care you need. Um, a next key point is that people believe shame will cure obesity. It does not. Um, so now we'll of the article. In 2013 uh, journal, journal article, bioethicist Daniel, um, Daniel Callahan argued for more stigma against fat people. People don't realize that they are obese, or if they do realize it, it's not enough to stir them to do anything about it, he, tell, he tells me. One of them, um, as one of the many stigma researchers who responded to Callahan's article pointed out, shaming smokers and drug users with dare um, style just say no messages may actually in have increased substance abuse by making addicts less likely to bring up their habit with their doctors and family members. Um, another key point is body shaming 
makes things worse. Quote, and in a cruel twist, one effect of weight bias is that it actually makes you eat more. The stress hormone cortisol, the one evolution designed to kick in when you're being chased by a tiger, or it, it turns out rejected for your looks, increases appetite, reduces the will to exercise, and even improves the taste of food. End quote. See? Shame trolls do not care about the health of people they harass. Their words are actually making things harder for people in a chemical way. Hmm. Next key point. Doctors just don't get it. Quote, according to several studies, thin doctors are more confident in their recommendations, expect their patients to lose more weight, than, and are more likely to think dieting is easy. Sarah, not her real name, a tech CEO in New England, once told her doctor that she was having trouble eating less throughout the day. Look at me, her doctor said. I had one egg for breakfast and I feel fine. And there are glaring cultural differences. Kenneth uh, Rezik now, a consultant who trains phys physicians to build rapport with their patients, says white wealthy and skinny doctors will often try to bond with their low-income patients by telling them, oh, I know what it's, lo it's like to not have time to cook. Their patients, who might be single mothers with three kids and two jobs, immediately think, no you don't, and the relationship is ir ir irretrievably soured. When Joy Cox, an academic in New Jersey, was 16, she went to the hospital with stomach pains. The doctors didn't diagnose her dangerously inflamed bile duct, but he did, out of nowhere, suggest that she get better if she stopped eating so much fried chicken. He managed to denigrate my fatness and my blackness in the same sentence, she says. End quote. Is this building a, picture, a portrait of how being fat reduces access to health care? How a person's health is negatively impacted by stigma in the way that being black is not inherently something that hurts health, but because of racism it becomes a risk factor? And when combined, they're devastating from a healthcare perspective. So to d explore more about the idea of intersecting ideas, um, Hobbes goes on to say, the effects of weight bias get worse when they're layered on tops of other types of discrimination. A 2012 study found that African American women are more likely to become depressed after internalizing weight stigma than white women. Hispanic and black teenagers also have significantly higher rates of bulimia. And in a remarkable finding, rich people of color have higher rates of cardiovascular disease than poor people of color, the opposite of what happens with white people. One explanation is that navigating increasingly white spaces and increasingly higher stakes exerts stress on racial minorities that over time make them more susceptible to heart problems. Oh, that's so depressing. Uh, another key point is that financial and educational structures make it worse. Quote, the problem starts in medical school, where according to a 2015 survey, students receive an average of just 19 hours of nutrition education over four years of instruction, five hours fewer than they got in 2006. Then the trouble compounds once doctors get into daily practice. Primary care physicians only get 15 minutes for each appointment, barely enough time to ask patients what they ate today, much less during all the years leading up to it. And a more empathetic approach to treatment simply doesn't pay. While procedures like blood tests and CT scans command reimbursement rates for hundreds to thousands of dollars, doctors receive as little as $24 to provide a session of diet and nutrition counseling. End quote. So, no advice or bad advice. Hobbes goes on to discuss um, what it is that doctors actually do to address the issue of weight, besides to bring up the, it up when a person just wants to get their strep throat treated. Um, quote, in a study that recorded 461 interactions with doctors, only 13% of patients got any specific plan for a diet or exercise, and only 5% got help arranging a follow-up visit. It can be stressful when patients start asking lots of specific questions about diet and weight loss, one doctor told researchers in 2012. I don't feel like I have the time to sit there and give them private counseling on, on basics. I say, here's some websites, look at this. 
A 2016 survey found that nearly twice as many higher weight Americans have tried meal replacement diets, the kind most likely to fail, than have ever received counseling from a dietitian. It borders on mal medical malpractice, says Andrew, not his real name, a consultant and musician who's been large his whole life. A few years ago, on a routine visit, Andrew's doctor weighed him, announced that he was dangerously overweight, and told him to diet and exercise, offering no few further specifics. Should he go on a low-fat diet, low-carb, become a vegetarian? Should he do CrossFit, yoga? Should he buy a fucking thigh master? She didn't even ask me what I was already doing for exercise, he says. At the time, I was training for serious winter mountaineering trips, hiking every weekend and going to the gym four times a week. Instead of a conversation, I got a sound bite. It felt like shaming me was the entire purpose. End quote. Isn't it interesting how something can be framed as so important to health, but there is, um, but there is no coherent approach to address it? It's hard to imagine other health issues treated that way. Like, hey, you have lupus, so, like, read up on it on this website. As previously mentioned, the idea of the state um, of being fat makes you sick more than the fat makes you sick. Hobbes uses research on bias outside the health field. This is how fat, sh quote, this is how fat shaming works. It is visible and invisible, public and private, hidden and everywhere at the same time. Research consistently finds that larger Americans, especially larger women, earn lower salaries and are less likely to be hired and promoted. In a 2017 survey, 500 hiring managers were given a photo of an overweight female applicant. 21% of them described her as unprofessional, despite having no other information about her. What's worse, only a few cities and one state, nice work, Michigan, officially prohibit workplace discrimination on the, base, by, on the basis of weight. According to a 2015 study, fat people who feel discriminated against have shorter life expectancies than fat people who don't. These findings suggest that the possibility that stigma associated with being overweight, the study concluded, is more harmful than actually being overweight. End quote. So, solutions. Most of this article is looking at the failures of the healthcare system, and doctors in particular. Not surprisingly, one of the solutions Hobbes suggests um, is addressing this. Doctors should be nice to patients. This probably seems like it should be a given, but as Hobbes points out, it most decidedly is not. Quote, the place to start is at the doctor's office. The central failure of the medical system when it comes to obesity is that it treats every patient exactly the same. If you're fat, lose weight. If you're skinny, keep up the good work. Stephanie Sog, a psychologist at Mass General Weight Center, tells me that she has clients who st start eating compulsively after a sexual assault, others who starve themselves all day after binging on the commute home, and others who eat a thousand calories a day, work out five times a week, and still insist they're fat because they have no willpower. End quote. No, sorry, quote continues. Um, acknowledging the if infinite complexity of each person's relationship to food, exercise, and body image is at the center of her treatment, not a footnote to it. 80% of my patients cry in the first appointment, Sog says. For something as emotional as weight, you would have to listen up for a long time before you give adv any advice. Telling someone to lay off the cheeseburgers is never going to work if you don't know what those cheeseburgers are doing for them. End quote. <sighs> I think this is such an important thing to bring up. It is cruel and fruitless to take away a self-soothing coping mechanism without replacing it with another. Being a person is hard, and people under tremendous pressure, and um, also those who can, they can experience any number of traumas in their life. They need ways to regulate their negative emotions that arise because of stressors. Fat people experience even more stressors because of external fat shaming and from internalized and in, internalized forms of fat shaming. And just in case you've made it here without hearing me say it, no one who fat shames, body shames, etc. is helping that person. The shame troll's response to, I just care about your health, is a lie in the purest form. No, you do not care about this person. 
you want to hurt this person. A nasty comment might terrorize a person into engaging in, in unhealthy diet culture behaviors temporarily, but no real positive change is sustained from terrorism. I think about this issue um, sort of in terms of dog whistles versus actual learning or real debate. For example, there are people who genuinely believe that the best thing that a teacher can do for an, an English language learner is to speak only English. There are people who that believe monolingualism is the best way to help children. There are also racist people who say the same things. How can you tell the difference? Well, when confronted with research and expertise, the genu genuinely good-hearted person changes their mind feels bad about the potential harm they may have done because of previously held perspectives, the genuinely racist person doubles down. The same is true for the good-hearted but misinformed person and the fat-phobic person. When confronted with evidence of how their words might affect a person is evident um, where a person is at. Um, the good-hearted person might have thought tough love or just being honest or being afraid of glorifying obesity were ways to help people. The way you know they're not is when they are confronted with the truth and they don't change. Every fat woman who has ever used a dating app or really done anything in the world knows that the person who claims to just care about their health does not care about their health. Mental health, physical health, emotional health, any kind of health. Not only do they not care, they actually want to harm them. They want to cause them pain. And they can, because society has a giant loophole for fat phobia that has been closed for so many other avenues in which to oppress, discriminate, or bully. Better yet, because of the intersection of misogyny, classism, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, etc., it allows for a backdoor way to express those other pre prejudices in a safe way. And I say this like there's two camps, the racist anti-bilingual advocate and the uneducated kind-hearted educator, the fat phobe and the genuinely concerned but person. But that's not really how it works. More accurately, there is no purely concerned person. There is a heavy dose of racism or fat phobia in that concerned person. The concerned person is a mythic uh, construct like compassionate conservative, a construct we want to believe. We want to believe this because whatever bullshit we, we are, are, are used to believe, we want to believe we are just misinformed and not because we ourselves are racist, misogynist, classist, and homophobic. But we were and we are. The author asserts that the American food system is a large part of the rise of obesity. Quote, the problem is that in America, like anywhere else, our institutions of public health have become so obsessed with body weight that they have overlooked what is really killing us, our food supply. Diet is the leading cause of death in the United States, responsible for more than five times the fatalities of gun violence and car accidents combined. But it's not how much we're eating. Americans actually consume fewer calories now than we did in 2003. It's what we're eating. For more than a decade, researchers have found that the quality of our food affects disease risk independently of its effect on weight. Fructose, for example, appears to damage insulin sensitivity and liver function more than any other sweetener with the same number of calories. People who eat nuts four times a week have a 12% lower diabetes incidence and 13% lower mortality rate regardless of their weight. All of our biological systems for regulating energy, hunger, and satiety, um, sorry, satiety get thrown out, off by eating foods that are high in sugar, low in fiber, and injected with additives, and which now shockingly make, shockingly make up 60% of the calories we eat. Just 4% of agricultural subsidies go to fruits and vegetables. No wonder that the healthiest foods can cost up to eight times more calorie for calorie than the unhealthiest or that that gap gets wider every year. Hobbes goes on to say that the medical um, benefits of this approach, being nicer to patients than they are to themselves, is how Sog describes it, are unimpeachable. 
In 2017, the U.S. Preventative Service, uh, Services Task Force, the expert panel that decides which treatments should be offered for free under Obamacare, found that the decisive factor in obesity care was not the, the diet, what the diet the patients went on, but how much attention and support they received while they were on it. Participants who got more than 12 sessions with, with a dietitian saw significant reductions in their rates of diabetes and cardiovascular risk. Those who got less personalized care show almost no improvement at all. End quote. Exercise is also a structural issue. Quote, it's the same with exercise. The cardiovascular risks of sed sedentary lifestyles, suburban sprawl, and long commutes are well documented. But rather than help mitigate these risks and their disproportionate effect, impact on the poor, our institutions have exacerbated them. Only 13% of American children walk or bike to school. Once they arrive, less than a third of them will take part in a daily gym class. Among adults, the number of workers commuting more than 90 minutes away grew by more than 15% from 2005 to 2016. A predictable outgrowth of Americans' underinvestment in public transportation and overinvestment in freeways, parking, and strip malls. For 40 years, as politicians have told us to eat more vegetables and take the stairs instead of the elevator, they have presided over a country where daily exercise has become a luxury and eating well has become extortionate. End quote. Um, now let's get to the children. What about the children? Interventions can make children healthier, but not necessarily lighter. Quote, many failed obesity interventions, in fact, successful health, eat healthier and exercise more interventions. A review of 44 international studies found that school-based activity programs didn't affect kids' weight, but improved their athletic ability, tripled the amount of time they spent exercising, and reduced their daily TV consumption by up to an hour. Another survey showed that two years of getting kids to exercise and eat better didn't noticeably affect their size, but did improve their math scores, an effect that was greater for black kids than white kids." End quote. So this study illustrates just how complex this issue is. Um, so getting kids just to just move more won't necessarily produce smaller children, but it could produce healthier ones. Okay. It's also about the money, stupid. Hmm. Quote, developing countries with higher wages for women have lower obesity rates and lives where are transformed where healthy food is, is made cheaper. A pilot program in Michigan that gave food stamps recipients an extra 30 cents for every dollar they spent on healthy food increased fruit and vegetable consumption by 26%. End quote. Real activism, not corporate feel-good glurge. Quote, Dr. Phil approved form of progress that celebrates the female entrepreneur who sells fat keenies on Instagram while ignoring the woman who gets fired from her management position after, work, after reportedly gaining 100 pounds over three years. Fat activism isn't about people feeling better about themselves. Um, it's about not being denied your civil rights and not dying because a doctor misdiagnoses you. End quote. All right, so that's an overview of, I think, the really important takeaways of the article. Um, now I am going to engage in a little bit of critique. So while, again, I think so much of this article is great and there are so, some aspects that are missing or not complete. So Hobbes doesn't discuss surgery. Bariatric surgery is a complex issue, and that and this isn't an episode about it, and many people do choose it, and it is effective for many people. Perhaps Hobbes doesn't discuss it because it, it's, it is a muddy issue. Should people be encouraged to do a permanent, risky, life-altering surgery, and who profits from it? These are all good questions, but it does exist, and people do do it, and it does help many people, and it seems strange not to address that. Okay. Weight loss doesn't improve health and emotional well-being. Is a, is a claim that is made in the article. So a counterpoint to that is that 
is from the NWCR, the National Weight Control Registry. Nearly all registry members indicated that weight loss led to improvements in their level of energy, physical mobility, general mood, self-confidence, and physical health. I think it is fair to say that there are many, many things in a person's life that can make them happy or not, and fat people can have wonderful lives and are not defined by their size. The pitying of fat people is definitely a part of fat phobia, but let's consider something about the people in the NWCR. They are people not caught in a dieting gaming cycle. These are people who maintain their weight. Weight maintenance is a very different animal than weight loss, both in mechanisms and, and that create it and the mindset behind it. Also, the vast majority of um, exercise for at least an hour a day. Think about all the benefits of this practice and think about how fat people can be discouraged from exercise because they're made to feel uncomfortable in fitness spaces. It makes sense that the salutary benefits of exercise alone could improve emotional well-being. But also think about if a person's weight limits their mobility, gaining mobility can make that person happier. Sure, okay. And if being fat bumps someone out because society treated them badly, that being thinner is less stressful, then sure that also makes sense. So perhaps Hobbes is correct um, in saying that weight loss doesn't improve health and well-being the way it is enacted by most people, but a different approach has different results. The ways people attempt to lose weight, specifically fad diets, crash diets, whole food group elimination diets, elaborate diets with very complicated rules, etc., are known not to work. Yes, Hobbes is correct in saying this. The research shows this. However, there is other research uh, about what does work. The percentage of people who successfully keep keep weight off might be small, but evidence from the uh, NW... um, NWRC, oh, sorry, NWCR, <laughs> oh, shows that there are some clear trends, some of which I have discussed in previous episodes. Things like a minimum of an hour of vigorous exercise, self monitoring weight and calorie intake, limiting TV watching, and my personal favorite of eating breakfast every day all correlate with sustained body composition change. Research shows that dietary changes paired with social emotional support programs like individual counseling and support groups are much more effective. Basically, we can infer that developing skills to cope with stress of having a marginalized body is important in order to make any sustained lifestyle change. In the article, Maintenance and Relapse After Weight Loss in Women, Behavioral Aspects, by Kame and Bruvald and Stern, they found that in comparing obese women, so I'm going I'm to quote their abstract, obese women who regained weight after successful weight reduction and women who had always remained at the same average, um, non-obese women were interviewed. Most maintainers, 90%, and control subject, subjects, 82%, exercised regularly. Most um, they were conscious of their behaviors and used available support, 70 and 80 percent respectively, confronted problems um, directly, 95 and 60 percent respectively, and used personally developed strategies to help themselves. Few relapsers exercised, only 34 percent. Most ate unconsciously in response to emotions, 70 percent. Few used um, available social support, only 38 percent, and few confronted problems directly, 10 percent. Just pause for a second. That finding, I don't know, that, that feels very significant. The, they, the only 10% of the relapsers confronted problems directly. That seems like something we should put a pen in and maybe look at again another time. Um, anyway, to continue. These findings suggest the advisability of d- development and prospective evaluation of individualized treatment programs designed to enhance exercise, coping skills, and social support. End quote. Finally, let's say a five foot five woman who weighs 300 pounds loses 30 pounds, 10% of her body weight. She might experience a huge improvement in health and quality of life and still go through life as a fat person. 
still subject to the slings and arrows of fat phobia, but improved nonetheless. But also, it's a very realistic and doable example. I am so grateful and impressed that Hobbes has opened up this conversation and exposed some very ugly truths. It's a call to action that is long overdue. But I don't want um, the, the woman in this example to believe that science says she's doomed, that she can't lose 30 pounds. This theoretical woman and her abil ability to change her body mass and composition are impacted by so many things in her existing circumstances and means, and it, certainly it is likely, likely given the brutal capitalist approach to weight loss that exists in our society, that she will be sold a bill of goods over and over again and shamed into despair rather than, say, a compassionate approach where interventions um, come from scientific research are deployed in, a, in the way that one would expect from a healing profession. Her success is unlikely because the tools she will likely encounter are bad, not because there aren't good tools, not because she is doomed. But that said, really real, healthy, sustainable body change might not produce the aesthetic, the aesthetic that signifies perfect health. So, where does this leave us? I think this article is for the most part well substantiated by research and accurately describes the big picture. This is essentially a call for compassion, understanding, and for real changes to a large system and not quick fixes or blaming of individuals. But no one should walk away from reading this thinking that there is no hope for them in making sustainable changes that improve their health, and that weight loss could be a result of that. The important takeaways are address your own fat phobia towards others and yourself. Don't accept poor treatment from the medical personnel. Reject diet culture. Embrace body positivity. Get support for your mental health and learn healthy coping mechanisms. And then finally learn about what research-based sustainable and maintainable practices you can adapt into your own life. <sighs> okay. That's bringing us to the end of this episode. Remember, if you have a topic in the health and fitness area that you'd like me to look at, send an email to maintaining.positivity at gmail.com. And if you liked the episode, like and subscribe and share on social media or with your mouth. And if you write a review, I promise to send you a picture of my head in a jar. All right, until next time. Bye.